Okay, it looks like we are live. How y'all doing? I'm Will, the Deep Sky Dude. Uh, there's been a lot of talk. Uh, I'm sure that a lot of y'all have heard and seen uh, the reports on this green comet that's coming to take over our automobiles and machines like in maximum overdrive. Uh, so let's talk about where we can see this thing, right? Um, because it's it's all in the news, how to see a green comet. It's going to flash across the sky. Comets don't do that, by the way. Uh, and we're going to talk about where to look, how to find it. Also, later this month, we have an incredible uh, occultation of Mars by the moon. Uh, so just like kind of like what we had, um, I guess it was in December, uh, where for some of us we had a conjunction where Mars was pretty close to the moon. And then uh, for some of us uh, in more northerly parts of North America, they saw the moon cover Mars. Uh, we'll talk about that at the uh, toward the uh, latter parts of this. Uh, but what I wanted to do was to, um, as we're kind of letting people come in here, I wanted to show um, sort of a, a bird's eye view of this comet. That's um, it's not coming. It's here. It's been here. Uh, in fact, um, me and some friends of mine looked at this comet in November at the El Dorado Star Party, which I just happened to pick this shirt out of laundry that wasn't uh, planned or anything. Um, but uh, we were actually looking at this comet in November. So it's nothing new. Obviously, it, it came around uh, what during the Neanderthals. It'll come back in 50,000 years. Uh, so we have all that going for us. We got some people in the chat, Pharaoh, hoping to get some clear skies soon to get some shots of the comet. Me too. It's been kind of clear here uh, where I'm at in Texas recently. Not too clear, but it's definitely been better than uh, it has been. Uh, I ordered a new mount from Amazon and got it without the, the bottom half of it. So I had to send it back, and uh, we're going to try again, I guess, round two on that. Yeah, thank you, Tony Bendel. Uh, I am not anyone's moon daddy. But hey, whatever. Uh, Dev says on January 25th, the comet will be aligned with two stars from the Big Dipper. We'll actually look at that because I think you're correct. Uh, we're going to check it out, how it's going to look in the sky, where you're going to need to look to find it. This thing is going to be easy to find. And in fact, there's going to be a point coming up over the next, well, I mean, couple of weeks um, where it's going to be up all night. So it doesn't matter what time of the night you go out and look. If you're in the Southern Hemisphere, you're out of luck on this one. If you're in Australia, South America, that, that, that sort of thing, you're out of luck on this one. But if you're in Northern America, you're going to see this thing very well. So let's get into the, uh, the software here. This is Sky Safari Pro. Of course, I just clicked on something else. And now the comet is gone because that's how it works. Uh, I can go to... Uh, brightest comets this will pop up and then we're down here on this one so this is the one right now and i wanted to do this before i go any further people are like oh it's a rare a rare thing a comet's coming by it's oh it's rare it's not rare at all watch this watch the screen all right as i turn on i can go up here to um solar system and then show comets. All right, watch what happens when I do this. On, off, on, off. Are you getting the Are you getting the picture now? Comets are not rare at all, ever. Big, bright, naked eye comets like Neowise, uh, Hayakutaki, and Hale Bop in the late nineties. That's rare ish. Um, Every few every decade or so that comes along, I'd say that's pretty rare. Um, but comets in general, no, not even close. Uh, at any one time, there's five or six, seven uh, observable comets through a small telescope in your backyard at any time. Um, so I just I wanted to highlight that because uh, this is in no way rare. This is our solar system. Right now, this is current time. Everything is uh, is as it is right now. You can see Earth here, of course, Mars. Uh, 
the inner planets and the sun. Now, this comet you can see came from way, way, way out here. Um, and I guess sort of the this part where it's not filled in, the the um, the part of the orbit that isn't filled in is probably due to some uncertainty. If I would zoom out, sort of, or maybe it just goes back a certain amount of time. But you can see this is a highly elliptical orbit, and you see all the all the planets are in this plane, this sort of ecliptic, right, that goes across the sky. But as we take the controls and we pan it. We tilt the, the the flat plate that is our solar system, and you can kind of get a bird's eye view or an underground, whichever way you want to look at it. Um, but you can see all the planets listed here and where the comet actually comes from and where it's going back out to. And I can speed time up so you, you guys can check this out. This is pretty fascinating. The comet was the closest to the sun about a week ago. Um, and you can see that it's actually going to get a lot closer to Earth. It's actually going to dive right in between Earth and Mars. So this is a, a, a you know, this is not a, a close call by any real stretch. I mean, in, in a solar system terms, it's pretty close. This is closer than than, uh, than sometimes that happens. But you can see as the hours go on, this comet is going to dive through. Uh, this is, uh, we're already into February, uh, middle February here. This is February 8th. Sorry, not middle February, the first week of February. So you can see that at the, around the first week of February, this thing is actually going to be closer to Earth than it was to the sun. The sun is the key thing here. Comets outgas because of the sun. And you'll notice something about comets when I zoom in here, that they always, the tail always points away from the sun. And that's because the sun is blowing off solar winds. And as that comet melts, it's just a, basically a dirty snowball in space. As it melts and gives off the gases and sublimates, uh, those gases blow away into the stellar wind. And that's why a comet's tail always points um, away from the sun with, with a certain degree. There is, there is some um, minor exceptions. And, of course, there's an ion tail, which I don't really go into that. Uh, today let me make sure we're good hey thanks josh good to see you happy to have you in the in the live thing uh neowise was my first naked eye comet but saw wurtenen oh yeah i remember that one through binoculars in 18 yeah i remember wurtenen i think i may have images of that one somewhere uh i don't know but let's get let's go back to like how it looks from earth and let's take a look at like what we what we can expect to see from Earth, because as you can tell from the simulation here, February eighth is sort of its closest approach to Earth, I guess, or sort of. I mean, it's hard to tell because Earth is running away from it, so somewhere in there, it's going to be its closest approach. Uh, Shane Gonzalez in the house. What's up, Shane? Good to see you, buddy. Calling three. Okay, uh, call three. I guess so I'll call four. Oh man, I clicked off of it again. Uh, okay, I need to go to history here. Uh, yes. There she is. All right, so that's our solar system view. Um, and this will kind of give you an idea of to why it's going to look the way it's going to look when we go through time. Now, I'm going to put it back to, to now, and you can see where it is in relation to the plane of our uh, solar system. I'd say it's... A few million miles from um, the plane here, uh, which is which is I, you know again it's a good thing. So let's go back home, and let's see. I can hide that. I can hit that. Make sure the okay we're working. All right. So here is the comet now. Um, this is right now, which would be a terrible time to view it. Uh, because most of y'all know that the sun uh, is currently in the sky. So let's um, let's delete the sun. Let's go to uh, 8 p.m. You can see the comet isn't up yet for tonight. So the comet uh, rises above the horizon about 11.30, let's say. Um, even that isn't good enough. You're going to need to wait until a lot later to see it. Um, I would say even into this range, so 2.30, 3, 3 a.m. Um, 
you might be like, hey, that's that's really early or really late. Well, if you hang on for a little while, this is going to change. So let's go through that. I'm going to go days right now. So let's set it to a respectable 140 in the morning. Let's say you set an alarm, you brewed some fine coffee and uh, some delicious gourmet coffees, and um, you want to go out and see this thing. So I'm going to put it on to days here, and I guess this is – translating let me make sure yeah y'all can see the little thing over here to the above me to the left hand side that is like what the time and day anything you do in sky safari is sort of dictated by this panel you can remove it uh, but i like to keep it because it's definitely very uh very helpful carl from carl's cosmos the ever famous carl there he is with one of the apollo whatever's probably 14 maybe i don't know Carl can probably fill us in. Is it expected to be brighter than Neowise? Well, what I love about comets is every comet that comes is like this, the comet of the century. You know, even Neowise are like, oh, it's going to be insane. Oh, it's going to be crazy. It was mediocre. It wasn't Hayakutaki. It wasn't Hale Bop. It wasn't Haley's. I, I, I wasn't alive for Haley's, so I don't know. But I was alive for Hayakutaki and Hale Bop, and those were unbelievable Apollo 11 that's one of the better ones to be able to see right there I guess what air and space museum then or Smithsonian very very cool man uh, good to see you Carl obviously very good to see you man hope to get to see you at Texas star party or at least uh, some astronomy meetings along the way um, so this is where we're at right now that's 1 30 in the morning if I roll days forward let's just start going forward today's the 20th well, it will be. Um, as we roll time forward, you can start to see what's happening. I'm going to take the orbit off because um, that isn't what we want uh, to see because it's it's moving counter to that. I think it's solar system. There we go. That there we go. All right. Um, so I can go back to my time tab and we'll start rolling time forwards. You can see I've already gone forward uh, three days. So you can see what's happening. We're starting to get really close to the Little Dipper. And for those of y'all that know the Little Dipper or know uh, stuff about astronomy, the Little Dipper is always up. It's always above the horizon if you're in the northern hemisphere for the most part. The further you go towards the North Pole, the higher Polaris gets in your sky. So it might be over there. If you're near the North Pole, it's like sh almost straight up. If you're in the Southern Hemisphere, it might be on the horizon or it might be below the horizon. So the, like I said, this is – but for us Northern Hemisphere-ers, um, we get the uh, Little Dipper all the time. It never sets per se, right? So as you can see, uh, 25th of January, we're getting closer to the Little Dipper. We're getting a lot closer. Um – and then this is, I think, about the point where, I mean, it'll basically be up all night long. Uh, you won't really have to, so if I switch back to hours, you'll see that as time goes on, it just, you know, as the hours tick by, it just circles what it looks like it's circling the North Star, even though it's not doing that. So from our perspective, it looks like it's doing that. All right. So I'll bring it back to now and we'll go back to days. And, well, I actually want to set that to a respectable time. Let's say midnight even. There's there's about midnight. It's about 1 a.m. right there. And then as you click the dates forward from today, you see where it goes. So it's sort of if you went outside every night, you'd see it sort of rising toward Polaris from the northeast and going, um, well, I guess southwest would be the path there. So you can see it just flies on by the North Pole. Um, I don't see it getting too close to any stars in the Big Dipper, but maybe uh, the person earlier was referring to the Little Dipper. I'm not sure. But let's zoom in and see. We are going to pass some really cool objects. So for the you photographers out there, you'll want to pay attention to, I think I found one of these dates pretty, pretty awesome. Uh, I think it's when it's in Taurus. Yeah, here we go. Uh, well, there's a good shot. Uh, the comet and Mars, this would be February 11. 
So February 11, you could uh, take a picture of Mars in a DSLR or whatever kind of telescope, and you would get a comet passing it by at um, midnight 45, right? Um, that would be a, a fantastic image because if you think about the, the 3D aspect of what we're looking at here, Earth is my fist here, Mars is my fist here, and the comet is literally in between us, which is pretty rare a lot of times when these sort of conjunctions happen, when two astronomical bodies get close to each other in the sky, it's called a conjunction. I would call this a conjunction of the comet and Mars. So that's, again, February 11th uh, at around midnight. Um, it's, it's usually a, a planet, a planet, and then a, an object like a galaxy or a nebula, a, a star cluster, even a comet. In this case, with the with the comet in between uh, us and the, um, I clicked off of it again. Sky Safari is touchy. You got to be careful. You got to be very careful, y'all. Um, it, it's cool to see that that sort of positioning here, which I think is very um, very cool. Ah, you know, I may have seen it too, then Carl, or I may have missed that. I can't remember exactly. Hey, Star Fox, welcome to the Coffee and Astronomy, if you will. Hope you're having a good day. Hope you're having a good one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Edward says he just cut a tree on the north side of his garden just in time, man. Good job, I guess, especially if it was kind of a tree that was in the way causing you some problems. Uh, that's not a bad thing. Um, so this is your first real good photo opportunity. Now, don't get me wrong. There's photo opportunities all over the place for this comet. Um, if you Google the name of this comet, the C slash 2022 E3 ZTF, uh, you'll find a lot of cool images from this comet. It is a very green comet, but they, and they're like, oh, it's the green comet. It's, there's a green comet coming. Well, a lot of comets are green. Uh, it's a common thing. That's like saying there's a red Mars coming. Hooray. It's always red. You know, comets are almost always green. That's not true, like almost always. There are a lot of times they outgas green. It's the carbon that they are um, sort of releasing from the, they're a dirty snowball, so they're primordial from the, from you know, the, the beginnings of our solar system, uh, these things. So they're icy. They got rock. They got all kinds of organic materials packed in, and then they get too close to the sun, and they start um, outgassing, and that's the, the tail that we see. And it just so happens in this one, it has a lot of the carbon that does the green thing, so we'll see it as a, uh, as a green comet. Any way to get both the stars uh, and the com comet sharp while stacking? Yeah, there actually is. Uh, you can track the comet. So um, if you're doing auto-guiding, Edward. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I'm not trying to uh, mispronounce it. But uh, if you're doing uh, a guiding, auto-guiding, you can actually, if the comet is bright enough, you can auto-guide on the comet. So then instead of the telescope following the sky, the telescope is very finely following the comet. That will make your stars appear as streaks, but it will give you a very pure image of the comet. Then what some people do is they'll take uh, a picture of that star field where the comet is, uh, take like a, a two-minute long or however many long uh, minute exposure of the star field. They'll go into post-processing and take that pure image, that long time exposure of the comet, stacked and, and prepped, and they'll take that and put it onto the star field that they imaged previously, and they'll sort of do a composite image of the comet. What I like to do is very simple when I'm shooting a comet like this. I like to show comets moving across the sky. That to me is that to me that's the coolest part of them that they're dynamic. Okay, so what I like to do is just say get this area of sky in your frame. So just this area and shoot that area and let the comet go across your field of view. To me that's the coolest thing because then you can kind of see 
the solar system in action, right? There's a lot of different ways to, to go down this road is, is, my, is the point of saying all that. Uh, how can you track the comet with a computerized mount without an auto guide? That's a good question, Carl. You could probably do it through ephemeris data if your ephemeris was good enough. I don't know if there is a source for a good enough ephemeris to plug into a mount to do that. Um, in my mind, and maybe there is a way, I'm not, I'm not saying that there's not. In my mind, it's, um, it's easier just to auto-guide the comet itself. Typically, uh, the coma or the, the, or the nucleus of the coma is, is a star-like, especially to a photograph. Sometimes even to our eye, uh, when we're viewing these things, um, and if it's if it's bright enough, typically it is. Even even with a you know a ten second uh, exposure, you can guide the comet, and then uh, like we were saying, uh, get a bunch of images, stack those images, uh, and process that out, and you'll get an image uh, of the comet that way. So that's one way to do it. Mr. De La Garza, Mr. De La Garza, sorry, Juan, what's up, buddy? Smokey, Smokey and the Bandit. I'm, I guess I'm the Bandit. That's what we're, we're gonna go with. That's Smokey. This is the Bandit right here. Uh, I haven't seen you in a good long while, Juan. I'm actually hopefully gonna be coming down your way to check out how things are going down uh, at Boca Chica, Texas, down there, South Padre. So yeah, Carl. Yeah, that's one. That's one way to look at it. Um, or uh, for those of y'all working with DSLRs and small wide field aperture, uh, small aperture wide field telescopes, maybe the best um, is sort of the way I've done it um, over the past because it is cool to see these objects sort of fly by other objects, especially like here where it's on February 11th. Uh, I'll, and I'll run time forward again when I get back the, the comet. And we'll go and we'll see... Uh, there was a there's this open cluster somewhere in Taurus, and it's gonna go it's gonna go by really close to that. I think it's this one down here. So I'll roll the days forward, and um, yeah, here we go, y'all. So at the same time of night, basically, um, we'll go back one day. So you get the 13th of February, and you get the 14th. So Valentine's Day. Um, the day before and the day after Valentine's Day, you get a really good opportunity as well. I think this is an NGC. It's not a Messier object. It's like NGC 1950-something or NGC 1647. So what you tell your telescope is, Carl, uh, you say, hey, telescope, go to – I don't have the data for the comet for whatever reason. Let's just say you don't have the ephemeris data to give your mount – right ascension and declination to go to the object that you're trying to photograph. But you know the right ascension and declination to NGC 6, 1647. So you just slew your scope over to 1647 and start tracking that. And if it's uh, the 13th or 14th of February, there will be a comet in your image unless it's a really zoomed in image then you're going to have to kind of move the mount to deviate a little bit and you should be able to find it very simply from that point um so that's a that's a good point to bring up carl and it's kind of like a back a backwards way to kind of get on target for an object like this uh, let's go through some more questions here i've run through the dates on the sky live and i see conjunctions with mars uh and three bright stars yeah um we're going to talk about the conjunction, um, oh, okay, Mars and three bright stars. Okay, well, maybe that's the ones that were back in that frame. Yeah, that could be it. The ones that were sort of back in that last few frames uh, with the comet. Uh, using Mono 294, that's the ZWO, I think, 294. It would uh, then make sense ph photographing in um, luminance, red, green, blue, and R. Uh, maybe that's an extra R there. Uh, or maybe I'm missing one. I can't remember. Um, thanks. Uh, any case, good work. I uh, spent days uh, watching your Star Party reports. Awesome. Thank you. And there's more of those coming. I've got Texas Star Party that I'm editing now. And this is 2022. Uh, Okie Tech's Star Party 2022 and El Dorado Star Party 
2022. All those videos are coming very soon. They should be out before the spring. So get your popcorn ready because they're going to be long. They always are. But I'm trying to take y'all on a journey, right? Y'all, I think most of y'all know. Uh, thank you for hanging out, Carl. You are always uh, welcome. Okay. Yeah, so narrow band plus uh, luminance red, green, and blue. Okay, gotcha. Um, yeah, and hey, this is a great, uh, in my opinion, shooting comets like this is a great uh, tool for um, um, color cameras where they have, where you don't have to do luminance and red and green and blue because with a comet like this, it's moving very fast and changing. Sometimes a black and white image of a comet is better because you can detect things like tail disconnect events, which are usually caused by solar winds. You can get stuff like um, outbursts in real time, like shockwave outbursts that come out of these things. There's a lot of really cool, uh, really interesting things that you can catch with just a black and white image of a comet. And I think for scientific purposes, most of them are. Somebody could probably correct me on that but um star fox says it's still cloudy here hoping it clears up in the next week i photographed neo wise my first comment with dslr there's the the lens stuff there for you came out great and was a blast you know what's funny about neo wise and um you know the L leonard comet leonard and uh some of the last few comments is i have some friends on like tiktok who are like those are the comments that got me into astronomy and i'm like that's amazing you know that's amazing that, because my story of how I got obsessed with astronomy is very similar. It was the comets Hayakutaki and Hale Bop, but originally the comet Shoemaker Levy 9 that got me into astronomy. Planets were cool, and I understood all that, even though I didn't have any idea what I was understanding as a kid. Now I do. Comets are a great way to pull people from the general public into astronomy because it happens to a lot of us. But Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9, SL9, for those of y'all who may be unfamiliar, crashed into Jupiter in 1994. So I was 10, 11 years old. And that blew my mind more than it blew a hole in Jupiter. Like it, To me, my little kid brain was like, wait, this stuff is changing. And that means the moon is subject to change, even though it's always the same sort of thing. So that was really, really fascinating for me as a kid. Kochab, Capella, and Aldebaran. Ah, so that's a, a very um, wide field. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's look at that. Let's look at that real quick. Um, so we know where it's going to be in the February range. I'll keep running the, the clock forward here a little bit. And there's Aldebaran right here. Uh, this bright star in Taurus, the bull. Um, so uh, it'll be pretty close to the Hyades cluster, which is this cluster here, believe it or not. This is an open cluster. This is an open cluster. It's just that this open cluster is way closer to us than this one. So um, open clusters do come in varying ranges. And here's another one right here, a little open cluster. So you can see these three open clusters, and they're probably vastly... Uh, different. This one's probably the furthest of the three, I would imagine. Could be wrong. It could just be smaller. Uh, this one's probably half as far as that one, and this one is probably half as far as that one. So I think this one's less than 100 light years away. The Hyades is the thing that makes up the Taurus, the bull shape in the night sky. Um, so yeah, and then it, it rolls down here. It looks like it's actually going into Orion, the, uh, the bow of Orion and this is actually as spring is starting to dawn for a lot of us here in the southern uh southern northern United States Texas area uh spring will have sprung by middle of February I can guarantee you that and you can see that every night this goes by you're gonna have to actually observe it later or earlier so let's roll the time back to 10 p.m. So as we get closer to Orion, as we pass the North Star, you can start going out earlier, I guess, or however you want to look at it, closer to sunset in your sky, and you should be able to see this thing. At this point, I have a feeling it's going to be a binocular slash telescope thing. I don't know if it's ever going to be 
naked eye. I know p- people have been saying that in the in the media and stuff, but always trust the media's uh, bias on astronomy uh, about five percent because. Uh, you have a lot of technical people, technical writers that write about softwares and you know computer stuff and whatever. And a lot of times, those are the the astronomy or that sort of thing for a lot of these media companies that write these blog posts and things that become these articles that we all share. So you just kind of have to take it with a grain of salt with some of these cats because sometimes they embellish things that don't, you know it's going to streak across the sky. Well, I've shown y'all here that. If, if you're talking about a month, something streaking across your sky, yeah. In, in galactic terms, this thing is, is like the speed of light. But to us humans, it's like a month's long thing. I mean, I, like I said, I've been looking at this thing since uh, November. We were taking our first pictures and video of it at the El Dorado Star Party in November. So this thing's been around for a while. Um, and one more thing I want to I go back to. Remember earlier, um, and here's, here's a really close with Capella for you dev that's the probably the three star alignment that you were referring to capella you said i don't think you said al ends and hadius but it could like i said it could have been an even more subtracted view um i want to show y'all right now so you know this is let's go to now let's go to sunset tonight or let's go to uh 10 p.m and I'm going to turn on that comets thing again. Okay? And I want I want to show y'all if I can find it. Solar system. I want to show y'all how rare comets are. On off. On off. Here's all the comets. Here's it without all the comets. Now those brightnesses are exaggerated. Yeah. But if you took a telescope that had photographic capabilities and you put it on everywhere you see a white dot appear and disappear, you're going to capture a comet, more than likely. A lot of these comets are magnitude uh, 14 and brighter, which 14 is dim, uh, and but they're photographic. So don't listen to the people that keep saying comets are rare. Naked eye comets are rare-ish. Every five to ten years or so, we get a decent one, you know, uh, an, an insane comet that, you know, goes across, the, you know, the tail goes across the sky. That's rare. Uh, and any comet can do that. This this comet here, it's really dim and sort of inconspicuous right now, but it could explode in brightness. We don't know. It, a big chunk of it could come off the side because it got... It heated up too much, and those gases blew a chunk of it off the side. Now it becomes this debris field that sort of is moving together. That can cause a comet to brighten immensely. Um, so um, there are things that can happen to make this thing bright. But as you can see, there are comets. I can, I can train, uh, go over here to the western sky and do the same song and dance. You can see there's just comets everywhere, and there's no real rhyme or reason to their placement in the sky because they don't really follow the ecliptic comets um like david levy said i say it all the time comets are like cats david levy is a famous comet hunter uh and he has a lot of fun sayings but my favorite is comets are like cats they have tails and they do what they want so there's there is that let's get to some questions real quick I saw a comment last dawn by binoculars. Oh, very cool, Lionel. Very nice. I, I wonder if it was this one, but if, if not, very cool. Um, would you favor using a 224 monochrome, no cooling, over the 294 monochrome LGB fluid? Uh, you know, Edward, um, I would – it depends on what you're looking for, for sure. Um, if you're looking for a more now, like – what is what does this ZTF comet look like now? Then I would go with a more monochrome, um, fairly longer exposure, but maybe not over uh, a few minutes. And then you when you start stacking, you just got to avoid the the elongation of the the nucleus of the comet. If you're looking for that now photo, so you need to take a bunch of maybe a little longer exposures, uh, but not as many, and stack those. Until you reach that threshold of where I took too many, 
the comet's moving too fast across the sky. I need to just start taking single shot exposures of it. Um, that would be where you'd want to do the the no cooling monochrome stuff like that because you can always denoise some of that stuff with the cooling. Uh, with LR LRGB, you'd be going for more of the beautiful comet image with that one. So what I would suggest with the LRGB stuff, do the um, uh, guiding on the comet thing. Get the comet in your field of view with your telescope. Select the comet's nucleus in uh, in PhD2 or whatever you're using to auto-guide. Begin guiding on the comet and then take your data run. Do your luminance, your reds, your blues, your greens, all that. I don't really know if narrow band is going to help much, but maybe I'm completely wrong about that. Uh, Sebastian Voltimer, a friend of mine on Instagram, has been taking sodium pictures of Mercury, y'all, and capturing the tail of Mercury. There is a tail of Mercury, a sodium tail that is long, millions of miles long, I think, or at least hundreds of thousands of miles long. And this is a guy with a backyard telescope, Sebastian Voltimer, okay, Voltmer, and he took pictures of this, this Mercury trail. It's unbelievable. And I think he's one of the first uh, amateur astronomers, but maybe one of the first uh, humans to image this from the ground. I could be wrong about that, but he's one of the first people. So that's narrow band imaging on solar system objects. It still works. Uh, I'd be interested to see what you had if you if you got some results there, Edward. Uh, Kochab on January twenty seventh. Okay, which is actually coming up very very close, very very close. Yes. Okay. Cool. Yeah. And so real quick, let's talk about this naming structure uh, down here. We'll talk about it really quick. I'm not going to belabor that because it's kind of like the boring stuff. For those of y'all that are curious, why do comets always have this sort of name? The C stands for comet. I know. I know that's crazy. If it had a P in, in where the C is, that would mean it was a periodic comet. So it would be a number and then a P. Um, that means it's like regular that it comes by, like um, Halley's and some of the smaller like um, Swift-Tuttle and those kind of comets that create a lot of our meteor showers. A lot of those have a P. That means they're periodic. They come by every 10, 20 75, 150 years, you know, stuff like that. Whereas comets like this are periodic. They come by every period, but the last time they did and the next time they will is like 50,000 years ago. So um, that's that's the naming structure there. The 2022, that's very self-explanatory, I would hope. That's the year that this comet was discovered by modern science, okay? Um, the E3 is another number designation. So inside the 2022 era, you have a letter and a number, uh, meaning that uh, that's like how that comet was discovered in what sequential order. So there could be another C22 blank blank ZTF comet, and there are. There's a bunch of ZTF comets. Uh, that's, the, that's who found it. Spoiler alert. But that E3 is a, uh, a letter number designation, so you'll know about when in the year it was found and what sequential order that was found in. And the ZTF, again, that's the name of the survey or the human or whoever discovered the comet. If you discover a comet, you get it gets named after you. Asteroids are a little different. You don't get to name an asteroid after yourself, which I think is kind of weird, but that's it is what it is. I, yeah, I don't know. Um, it is what it is. Uh, Juan says, I have a Canon Rebel T5 DSLR. It's a great camera. 300 millimeter lens. Would I be able to catch a decent shot of it? Was able to catch Neo wise? I think one, I think the answer is yes. Uh, and Star Fox is wondering the same thing. I'm now wondering the same thing because here's the thing, Juan. Um, I think in a few days, the answer is yes, but I'm not sure at 300. That is very, very, very wide, wide field. Um, I don't know exactly how many degrees that is. That's a good amount. I think you could probably easily get all of Orion in a shot like that. So unless this comet outbursts and becomes this insanely bright thing, um, I think it would be in your data. Yeah, I think it would be in your data, but part of me wants to say it would be like really subdued you'd have to like crop down in to even really maybe tell right now now if it has an outburst that could be a different story 
and I'll be I'll be watching it right along with you on. I want to try to get a few images of this myself again, going through the mount issues, but that's how it goes. Um, so yeah, that's a great question. Now, with anything higher than three hundred, like if you have a telescope that's say four hundred millimeter up to a thousand millimeter, which is typical for sort of wide field scopes, yes. So I think the answer is ultimately one yes. I think you could um, if you're tracking, but also maybe not. Um, what we'll do is after I get to this next question, we'll go look at what we're looking at over the next couple of days, and um, we'll see if you can't figure out how and when to get a shot of it. Uh, I suggest everyone click here on the thumb up to share on your favorite social networks. Thank you so much, Ed. I can, if I can call you Ed, I think that'll probably be okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for the uh, for that. The shares and all that. I appreciate y'all. Y'all help me get this out. Again, I just do this for fun. Uh, a lot of this I do as a pep talk to myself sometimes, you know, so I can get in here and be like, hey, go take images or whatever, you know. Um, but a lot of this is uh, obviously uh, to help uh, others uh, find stuff like this too. So let's look at it real quick, and then we'll go on to the uh, occultation, which is coming up at the end of January. I don't want y'all to miss that because that's going to be a, photo, uh, a, a photographic event, uh, no doubt. So we'll go to history. I'll click on ZTF. And you'll notice, I, I know y'all can kind of see some of these. Like we have um, uh, this comet here. Uh, this one's out right now. This is uh, C2021. I'm sorry. No, no, no. I clicked on the wrong one. This is 26P, Grig Skjellerup. Okay, so Grig and Skjellerup are the two people or surveys or whatever they are that found it. Uh, and it's a it's a, a periodic comet because it has that P. Except uh, this one right here is a, is a different though. It's Mori Attard, uh, and it's 2021 X1. And so you can see that there's all these, there's all kinds of comets right now. You can, if you have a telescope, man, you can just start racking up comets like crazy. I'm telling you, uh, it's, it's the telescope is where it's at now. Naked eye comets are rarer, but they're not, they're not at all very rare. Um, so here's ZTF. This is the one we all care about. And by the way, the ZTF stands for, if it, you know, useless bit of uh, jeopardy trivia, the Zwicky transient facility which is a part of the Palomar Observatory. Uh, and a lot of these comets, you'll notice, Neowise, um, uh, um, Atlas, uh, they, they've got um, the ZTF. A lot of those are surveys that are just taking pictures of the sky every night. They usually do the whole night, not, whole sky every like couple nights or so. They're going to be the ones finding all the comets because back in the day when you had people like um, Hayakutaki, and uh, Hale, I forget what it is, is it Alan Hale, uh, and I forget uh, Bop's first name, but you have people like David Levy finding Levy comets, uh, Gene and Carolyn Shoemaker finding Shoemaker comets. They, they were getting named after them because they were finding them. They were the ones that were locating these things. Um, so, you know, all of that, all that plays into this, um, which is really cool. So the ZTF, the Zwicky Transient Facility, got the naming convention for this one. So tonight, if we go to tonight, uh, right now at 2 a.m., this is where you're going to want to look for the comet. You're going to need a, a planetarium software of some kind. Again, I use Sky Safari both here on my computer and on my cell phone. There's other great ones out there, y'all. There's all kinds of free softwares out there, so don't feel like you're ever stuck in one software. There's dozens of softwares out there. So remember that. Um, the constellation lines aren't showing up too well in here. Maybe I can actually change that. I'll go to um, uh, that's probably better. Sometimes you have to, yeah, there we go. The resolution was kind of, so sorry about that, y'all. Sometimes I have to switch back and forth to see how it's coming through on the screen share. Uh, the big uh, kite-looking constellation on the right, that's Bootes, or Booties, as I've heard some people call it, which I think is hilarious. It's Booties. Uh, and the, the most prominent one on the left here is the Little Dipper. 
So you're going to want to take your uh, your nighttime softwares and find Bootes, which is this one over here on the right, just to the right of the comet. Um, the easiest way to find Bootes is to take the Big Dipper, which is up here. Everybody can pretty much find the Big Dipper, especially if you have a you know a smartphone doing it for you. And you take the handle and you arc. The handle arcs, right? It arcs to Arcturus. That star right there is called Arcturus. So if you take the handle of the Big Dipper and you arc to Arcturus, that's going to give you Bootes, the constellation. And it's a sheep herder or goat herder or something. I don't know. It's an association of stars to me, and I'm sure it is to you. But if you can get in between here, Juan, um, and sort of find the the tip of Bootes, this sort of nice triangle of stars here, and you'll see it in the sky once you know where everything is. You'll kind of be looking up and you'll go, oh, okay, especially in Brownsville area. Uh, you should be able to kind of break through the light pollution and be like, okay, there's Arcturus and then, yeah, that area. And just softly you know, nudge your camera to the left towards the North Star. That's it. Um, because the left, telling people to go to the left is going to change. Watch. Um, let's say the person, whoever it was, wanted to photograph it later in the evening. Well, if I go left of Bootes now, I'm off in the Big Dipper because to my eye, here's Bootes, and I go left, right? So you almost kind of want to follow this pointing to Arcturus thing, the the uh, the North Star Polaris being right here, and it's sort of in between the two because as tonight goes on, I mean, this is, well, we're into 6 a.m. Let's go back because you won't be photographing then. The 4 a.m. is about where people start to hang their hat. Um you can see where it's going to be. So again, use this the, these pointers off Bootes to you know come down, come down away from it, and uh, you should be able to find the area. It's not naked eye yet. This comet, I think, uh, last last estimation or approximation of how bright it was came in at like uh, magnitude like uh, eight, which is still way past naked eye range most humans can't see anything naked eye past like magnitude four so this is double as dim uh as sort of the the faintest naked eye thing maybe two or three times dimmer um so don't grab don't don't go out with your eyes and expect to see this thing like in some movie um shoot across the sky that's a meteor that's not a comet um and comets are moving, but they're moving more akin to the speed of the moon or something like that, uh, night to night or something slower. Okay, any questions about uh, ZTF, Echo 3, which is the comet of the – it's the comet of the century, y'all. It's going to be brighter than a, than a, a dinner plate or something. Whenever, remember when they used to say, Mars is going to be bigger than a dinner plate. Okay. I'll wait around for that one. Um, we'll be waiting for a while. While the questions are coming in, I'm going to set this up for the occultation. Now, this is the comet's an object you can take in. If the next several nights are going to be cloudy for you, no big deal. Catch it on the next clear night. This next thing, however, is uh, something you're not going to be able to do that with. An occultation is um, an event that happens and then it's not happening, if that makes any sense at all to you. Uh, let's find, let me just do this. Let's go to moon. Search the moon. There is the moon. And I think I might have gone past it. No, here we go. All right. So we are on January 30th. And this is 4 p.m. Now you might be like, "Well, that's not that's not dark yet. We can't see, we can't see it in the daytime." Yes, you can. You can definitely see the moon if you have a telescope and you know exactly where to point it. You might even be able to pull out Mars in the daytime. Some of the bigger, br brighter planets, absolutely. But for the sake of the the argument here, the moon is uh, easy naked eye during the day. For those of y'all that have seen it during the day, you know what I mean. Um. So here we go into, let's just roll all the way to it. 
Now this is where uh, I am at. Okay, this is so it's gonna be a little different for some of y'all out there. Um, let's go back to this question real quick that Juan has for us. When uh, will it be the best brightness? So that's a good question. Technically, with a comet, um, the best brightness is when it's closest to the sun. However, if a bright comet is closer to Earth, then it's going to appear brighter. So there's a factor. Comets will often, uh, you know, either condense or expand with how much solar radiation they're getting. So that can definitely increase or decrease the brightness. So to answer your question, Juan, we don't really know. It's predicted, I think, to get a little brighter, but not much. But again, comets are like cats. They have tails and they do what they want. So all we can really do is be ready and know where it's going to be and when. Go take the da the data and the images as it, as time goes on, and then we'll know. Um, so, really, your guess is as good as mine on that. Um, there is a there is a graph, you know, of like it's getting brighter, it's at its peak brightness, and now it's going down. But we don't know if we're at peak brightness yet because time ha you know the comet hasn't gone away from us and back out to the outer solar system. There's a point where the brightness could trend down and then go right back up. We could get like a, a an outburst, you know. Um, so. It's it's hard to tell. Long 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 answer. Uh, long answer made longer. Uh, where is Planet X? There is no real Planet X. That was all a miscalculation. They were trying to figure out why Neptune's orbit was perturbed. Uh, there may be more planets. In fact, we know there are more dwarf planets past the Neptune area. But so far, no Planet X. No detection of anything out there, even close to the sort. Uh, okay, this is gonna this is gonna be awesome, y'all. This is another occultation. We just had one of these, and I'm gonna do a whole live stream, hopefully capturing this in real time, but also hopefully before the event again. So for those of y'all that might be watching this later, um, maybe we'll get another live stream going, and you can catch that one live. This is gonna happen uh, over the course of this night, and then that's it. Uh, we won't get another one of these for a while. So I'm going to set it to minutes here. What's going to be awesome about this occultation is sort of the way it's going to happen. I'm going to center, yeah, I'll center Mars. Mm. That's okay. I, it kind of puts it at the bottom of the screen. But y'all kind of get what's going on here. This is the terminator of the moon. The terminator is just the, the, the area where daylight and night happen. So... The termination of daylight is what you could, um, how you can kind of remember it. And the Terminator all, is always changing. It's always running across the surface of the moon somewhere. Um, so that means the sun is down this direction. Uh, the sun is down in this image. So that's why this part of the moon is illuminated. So we have this dark side of the moon right here. And yes, that is the dark side of the moon, believe it or not. Because the dark side is dark. The far side is far. The far side never faces us. The dark side does sometimes face us. So the dark so part of the dark side of the moon is facing us. The dark side of the moon is the unilluminated side. The far side of the moon will never face us. So remember, those two things are different. So we have a little bit of the dark of the moon here, which is cool because uh, I'm going to zoom in on Le Mars. And if you had a telescope which a lot of y'all do, that can get an image of Mars similar to what you're seeing here or thereabouts. If you run, I'm going to do this very slowly here. You're going to start to see stars disappearing. I'm just clicking. Every click I make is a minute that goes by. Uh, and let's go to real time here. So if you have a nice telescope, like a schmidt cassegrain a maxitov cassegrain a long focal length Dobsonian or Newtonian reflector, that kind of thing, a long focal length refractor. You could get something like this where you could just take an image or a video of Mars, and this is real time. I ran the time forward now. I think I can switch back, monitor, make sure there's no questions coming in. It looks like time is still rolling in the simulation. Now what we're going to start seeing is Mars being deleted 
from the bottom because that dark side of the moon, that unilluminated side of the moon is going to start to kill Mars from our point of view. It's basically like a Mars eclipse, okay? That's how you can kind of think about it. So it still hasn't started touching yet, and I don't know where the moon is in this simulation yet. I have no idea because, again, this is real time. It's kind of like watching grass grow. Uh, in fact, I'm going to zoom in so when it starts happening, we can see the change a little more. Again, this is further zoomed in than you'd probably be able to do with most telescopes. I mean, this is like a Hubble view of Mars here, okay? Uh, let's go to Lionel's question. Better with no expectation of brightness? Yeah, it kind of is, right? It's kind of like a, a movie that you don't know the uh, the ending to, right? Um, we could get this insane outburst or we could get a fizzle. I mean, it's, it's so hard to predict with comments. That's what I love about them, though. I think you're right, uh, Lionel. You're, you're onto something there. So I probably should have started the moon a little closer. <laughs> At this point, the actual occultation will happen before it does in this sim. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to stop time. I'll move it forward a minute and see what happens. Oh, boy. See, that's what I get for messing around with something. Because it was about to happen, probably. Here we go. Okay. So we have less than a minute to wait. While that's happening, there it goes. Uh, let me know if y'all have any questions, please, in the chat as we kind of wrap things up here. So this is 11.16 p.m. or 11.15 p.m. in Central Time on Monday, January the 30th, okay? This won't happen the next night. It won't happen on the 31st. Does it have, yeah, it has the 31st. This will only happen on January 30th at 11.16 p.m. Central Time. Now, if you're in Eastern... Uh, Pacific Mountain, this will shift a little bit. Um, and there, the whole Mars is gone now into the dark of the moon in less than a minute. Okay. So now we get the fun task of cut, watching it come out the other side. So if we zoom out here, you'll see that it's just the the moon... Sort of, I mean, I know Mars is peeking out from behind there, but that's that's not true to scale as we know. It's just over-exaggerated. That is what you would see if you came out at 11.17 p.m. on January 30th, 2023. You'll be like, where's, Mar where's Mars? I thought it was supposed to be really close to the moon. It's behind the moon because you came out too late. If you came out at 11, you'd be like, oh, wait, there it is. Because as you get closer to the occultation... Mars will, it'll kind of mix in with the moon and you'll kind of lose it. Uh, it's fascinating how that happens. So let's stop real time. We'll go to minutes. I'm going to move time forward. You can see the moon is really what's moving here. That's what's changing uh, in this particular event, an occultation. All right. So let's do the same experiment we just did but zoomed way, way in, like some kind of ridiculous telescope view. I'm going to go to real time, and I'm going to roll time. So here we go. Now Mars is going to pop out right here, and if you had a, a really nice telescope with you know an extreme zoom, you would be able to get this, uh, no problem. Thank you for joining, Juan. Good to see you, buddy. As always, I still have your patches. I haven't forgot about that. I still have your patches. They're in my uh, in my safe with lots of other important things. So they're still yours, buddy. Uh, I just got to get down there to give them to you because I don't want to mail them. That's just so impersonal, right? I got those for us. So uh, I will be getting those to you, my friend. Uh, when I come down to visit, we'll have coffee or some seafood. Oh, man. South Padre, y'all, has some of the best seafood. I mean, obviously, it's right on the coast of Texas, right? But like seafood... Uh, Mexican food, um, I, it's, it's all there. Brownsville has great food. So, okay, here's the moon. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm Mars. Let's back it up a few. Uh, let me stop this, and I'm just going to back it up seconds, just a few seconds here. Because I want, you know, I want to sort of say, uh, you know, in, in set in stone when these times are. But you can see here at 1215 
a.m. So what? Less than an hour later, at 12.15 a.m. Central Time, on now it's January 31st. So we're going from January 30th into the 31st uh, in Central Time. And I'm going to put it back to real time and roll the beautiful bean footage. And you'll start to see Mars emerge. Now that emerged about 12.15.30. Um, and we'll see how long it takes. So there's about 30 seconds there. So about 40, less than a minute. It's 40 seconds or less. I'm seeing almost 37. There's 40 seconds. About 40 seconds is how long it takes from one side of Mars to move out from behind the moon. And again, that's the moon moving more than anything else. Mars is moving in our sky, but not enough to really affect that, per se. Uh, the moon, yes. And that's what it would look like in real time at an, an insane, uh, an insanely um, insanely fast rate. I'm just going to back this up here a little bit because you can see what's sort of happening. So, I mean, any time is, uh, on that night and into the next night is awesome to view the conjunction because right about here, or maybe even in here, is where you'd start to separate the bright moon from dim Mars, naked eye, where you could be like looking at it just with your eyes and you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I see Mars now. Because even though Mars isn't behind the moon anymore, your naked eyes, no matter how good they are, it's going to get blinded out by the moon at a certain point, even when Mars is visible. Like if you looked with binoculars, you'd be like, oh, yeah, yeah. And then you'd take them away and you'd be like, oh, I, can't, I can't split them. Um, so this is about when you start to split them, about 12.20 about uh, a.m. on that night. Um, and that's really it, y'all. This is one of those events that definitely worth photographing, definitely worth watching with binoculars or a telescope if you have one. Um, it happens like that. It won't happen again for a very, very long time, or at least a year or more for most of us. Um, so it's a fairly rare event, not that rare. Um, but it's an event that you don't get the, the grace of time that you get with Comet uh, ZTF, or whatever we're going to call it. Um, Comet Echo 3, I guess it sounds cooler. Uh, sounds like a, some sort of plane, I guess. Um, and with that, if there's any more questions, I will happily take those questions if you're not following me on social media y'all please do i'm on instagram tiktok all these like that you're watching me on i post way more stuff to instagram and tiktok than i do here on any of these platforms that i'm currently live streaming uh that's because of algorithm suppressions and other things like that uh, i do most of my live streams now on tiktok exclusively uh, so if you're not on TikTok, I don't know how to help you. I'm still trying to do these to, to be around for people who are on these platforms. Um, I know a bunch of y'all are on YouTube. Uh, I know some of y'all are on Facebook. Um, but Facebook is just not uh, a good streaming platform anymore in any, in any way, shape or form. I don't even like going live on Instagram because it's just not set up to expose your information that you're trying to get out to a wider audience, right? So um, please follow me on TikTok. Please follow me on Instagram if y'all are over on those things. I will be doing a live uh, TikTok on basically these two things later tonight. So if you're on those apps, follow me at Deep Sky Dude. You can see it floating past right there. Um, I'm also on Spotify, uh, iTunes, Apple Music, YouTube Music, all those music platforms as the same artist name, Deep Sky Dude. I've got lots of music out there if you're into that sort of thing. And uh, no, no, guy, that is unacceptable. We can't, I refuse to use a telephone name as a name. That's too much. I could be like, hey, guy, did you get a picture of Comet 2022E3ZTF? Or I could be like, guy, did you get a, comment, a picture of uh, Echo 3 or E3? And you'd be like, I, I know what you're talking about. Uh... The, I mean, the names are obviously for science. We have to have them. And we could just call it that. But 
I argue, I postulate we should uh, use an alternate naming scheme. We should name, we should nickname it like uh, the Hulk or something because the media was like, oh, it's a green comet. Com oh, no. What are we going to do? Uh, and we could we could call it the Hulk, and maybe the Hulk just doesn't get angry and buff up. You know, maybe it's just Bruce Banner. I don't know. Uh, thank y'all for watching. Uh, appreciate y'all sharing the live stream and doing all that stuff. Y'all are awesome. Thank y'all for subscribing. Remember, follow me on the other platforms if y'all are out there. Uh, and that's all I have for this afternoon. Again, I'll be doing some more of these as time goes on, as as more stuff flies across our skies. At night, I'll be doing these live streams. So uh, thank y'all. Thank y'all for joining. Thank y'all for watching. Please subscribe. Please follow and all that, you know, all that stuff. Y'all know how to do. Um, oh, and thank you. Thank you, Lionel. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. I've got a new album coming out. I am working on that right now. I started work on it uh, in like late uh, November, early December hardcore again where I'm refining stuff and getting the tracks, you know, you polish them, you, you have a, you have a form and then you polish it and it goes and it uh, becomes a thing that you get tired of a piece of art that you just get tired of. I'm tired of tweaking knobs that aren't really making the song any better. Right. So that's kind of the thing there. The new music is coming. Mr. Eddie Trevino. Thank you, buddy. Good to see you, man. Amazon smile is ending Eddie. I was going to text you that earlier today or yesterday. Uh, our friend Tyler Troutman messaged me and was like, dude, did you see that uh, Amazon smile is ending? I was like, what? I, but then I was like, well, I guess all good things must come to an end, right? So our astronomy club has benefited immensely from the Amazon smile program. I think we've gotten uh, close to $2,000 just from our members shopping, uh, slowly defunding Blue Origin or Jeff Bezos's yachts, however you want to look at it. Uh, and go into a good cause. But I hear as Amazon's smile shuts down, they're doing a uh, an increase in how much they're donating. So I guess, you know, if you shop on Amazon, don't forget to support your local or your, your favorite nonprofit because now is the time. Uh, it is going away. I had the same face, Eddie. Um, so that's the thing. Uh, that's the thing that we're going to have to deal with uh, as people who shop on Amazon, but it is what it is. Um, so... With that, though, thank y'all for joining. Uh, we'll see y'all very, very soon. We've got some, uh, I got some cool videos coming out soon on here on YouTube. Uh, so if you're on Facebook, please be sure to go over to YouTube and follow me there. And uh, clear skies, y'all. Take care of yourselves. Take care of someone else. I'll see y'all on the flip side. And outro.